Uh, so I suppose I should start by saying thank you for staying. Uh, that was going to be an awkward introduction, we thought, there. But glad to have everyone here. My name is David Malin. Uh, I teach a course called CS50, or Computer Science 50, at Harvard University. This is our introductory course in computer science. And over the past 10 or so years, we've experienced an evolving uh, use of technologies, pretty much all of them driven by pedagogical goals we have, as well as technological goals. And what we thought we'd try to do today is tell the story of our past several years, uh, from bare metal all the way now to containerization, giving you a sense of some of the things we did right, some of the things we did wrong, ultimately why we did it, so that hopefully you don't have to reinvent some wheels or some decision making along the way that we ourselves already did. So to just give you a bit of context and high level overview, uh, this is what the course physically looks like, at least in its first days on campus. So we have some 800 students, uh, 800 undergraduates at Harvard taking this class. It's a course for majors and non-majors. It's a fairly traditional syllabus uh, underneath the hood, uh, whereby it's meant to serve as a solid foundation in computer science for students who want to go off to uh, further studies in computer science. But for about half of the class, it's also meant to be a terminal class, whereby this is the one and only CS course they might take. And when they return to their own fields in mathematics and the social sciences, natural sciences, arts, humanities, or beyond, they actually have some practical skills that they can bring to bear on problems in those particular domains. Uh, beyond being offered on campus, though, we have quite a few students elsewhere. We have um, some 350 students in the Cambridge area and beyond in Massachusetts and online through Harvard's Extension School or continuing education program for young folks and older folks alike. Uh, it was rather curiously, this past year, we started offering the same course at Yale University, whereby it's offered in parallel with student bodies on both campus using the exact same curricula, uh, the exact same tools, the exact same homework assignments, all of them in parallel in two physical locations. There's a variant of the course at Harvard's Business School. Uh, for the business students there, that's a smaller scale, but uses uh, some of the similar technologies that we'll give you a taste of today. And then our largest demographic is the so-called MOOC version of the course, Massive Open Online Course through edX, an online educational platform by Harvard, MIT, Berkeley, and now others, um, that for CS50, we have some 700,000 registrants, not all of whom engage certainly actively, but it's an even bigger demographic than the ones we have on campus. We also have uh, satellite uh, instances, if you will, local support structures in such cities as these both domestically and abroad. Um, and then also, and particularly excitingly, have we been focusing over the past year on what we call CS50 AP. This is an adaptation of this college level class to a high school audience, particularly an AP style audience, advanced placement, that will satisfy the college board's forthcoming AP CS principles curriculum, whereby we, Harvard and CS50, are providing teachers and students alike with a whole bunch of freely available curricular resources, not only homework assignments and video-based assets and uh, and other materials, but also the tool chains with which they can tackle those problems in their classrooms. And so indeed, each of these demographics has motivated finding solutions to different problems, but we've aspired to try to uh, solve as many of these problems as we can using ultimately the same infrastructure. At the end of the day, indeed, all of these versions of CS50 at the college level, uh, the MOOC level, the high school level are curricularly and technologically equivalent. And so our goal has been to see where the commonalities are technologically underneath all of those demographics. So if you rewind about 10 years, or 20 plus years now, um, for many, many years, we used an on-campus cluster, as many universities might have done. So we had a, a Unix cluster or a Linux cluster, so a whole bunch of physical machines somewhere in a basement on campus, all of them load balanced somehow back in the day via DNS and then more recently via fancier hardware. And students all had shell accounts on these computers, so they could Telnet back in the day or later SSH to a centralized cluster on which they had home directories and tools like GCC and GDB and other command line tools in a standard Linux or Unix environment. But there were a number of shortcomings, um, some number of upsides and downsides, but most of them we felt uh, downsides in the end. One, an upside though, is that this was managed by the university. The IT staff for the university were kindly managing, managing this environment, not only for us, but for others as well. Two, it was familiar to students. Before there was Gmail and other web-based email applications, people were using Pine and Mutt and other such tools, so they were already telnetting and SSHing to the central environment. So if they were using it for email, we used it for programming environments as well. But we, as the class, did not have root access. Only the IT team did. Um, it had generally outdated software. If we wanted to use the latest and greatest of GCC or GDB or any tool, usually we were several years out of date. This was understandable insofar as they had not just our class, but many other classes at Harvard. So stability was of importance. But for us, trying to be a little more cutting edge, and not so much with tools like that, but with um, as web-based software was becoming popular, providing students with different tools and services, database software and the like, it just wasn't an environment on which we could install such things as that. 
um, perhaps more uh, tangibly, there was just no after support hour, uh, after support, uh, no after hour support. Um, and so invariably, when something would break, it would be at 5.01 PM. And unfortunately, whereas most staff at Harvard may, would maintain a 9 to 5 schedule, I dare say many students would maintain a 5 to 9 style schedule. And so it wasn't a great alignment when anything broke, especially when the syllabus is particularly rigorous when it comes to keeping to deadlines. So we transitioned in 2008, after years of using this on-campus cluster, around the time that Amazon Web Services was starting to gain some traction. It was still very nascent. There wasn't much in the way of services. Right now, if you go to Amazon, uh, aws.amazon.com, it's kind of overwhelming how many different icons and services they had. So back in 2008, there was relatively little. But there was EC2, the Elastic Compute Cloud, and a few other services. And so what we aspired to do early on was try to replicate the idea of that cluster uh, using NFS and home directories and other things, using them uh, in the exact same way in the so-called cloud as we were doing on campus. but being our own system administrators. And so we set up a bunch of virtual machines. We wired them together using a homegrown load and balancing solution, had a whole bunch of disk space, NFS mounted across all of them. And we replicated exactly the same environment with which students were familiar, but had 100% control over it. So among the upsides early on, for a topology that ultimately looked a little something like this, where we had a front end virtual machine at the time doing what elastic load balancing, so to speak, would now do, and a whole bunch of back end servers for which students could then uh, SSH and just write code. And we uh, use predominantly C in the class, therefore things like GDB or more recently Clang, or sorry, GCC and more recently Clang and uh, GDB and other tools. But we also do a bit of web programming toward the tail end of the semester using tools like uh, PHP and JavaScript and MySQL and other such services for which we never had access on Harvard systems to installing those kinds of things ourselves. So among the upsides where we finally had root access and could put in on it, uh, for better or for worse, whatever we wanted to, more pedagogically compelling, we could ima examine students' code in situ whereby we could just SU and become them if we actually wanted to see some problem they were having and moving away from the incredibly annoying and unproductive emailing of files back and forth or some other out-of-band mechanism. Uh, there was no need for space, power, or cooling, so we didn't have to solve these problems ourselves on campus. We just punted to Amazon for something like that. Uh, more reliable insofar as there was much more redundancy in Amazon's cloud than there was for our own little cluster on campus. Um, more scalable for similar reasons. Um, topical for class, or at least we thought. We thought it would be cool and trendy to actually weave into the course's curriculum that year um, discussions of cloud computing and what it actually is underneath the hood and how virtualization leverages increasing numbers of cores and CPUs. Um, fun fact, um, the students tended not to care. In fact, we had abstracted away so much of this deliberately that no one really cared what was underneath the hood, at least in the introductory course. So we've since focused a little less on those kinds of topics. But it was incredibly time consuming to administer. Um, I didn't quite think this through, perhaps, enough that gaining all of the pluses that we wanted uh, came with uh, a number of minuses, all of which fell on my and the team's shoulders. Um, it was difficult at the time to configure Amazon. There wasn't much in the way of pointing and clicking or even the command line control of the environment. So if we wanted some service, we needed to build, compile, configure it ourselves. Um, unfamiliar to students, uh, at least the environment, uh, how to get there. They weren't using the same environment anymore as their own code. And then there was things like latency, at least some of the more advanced students who might use X applications, graphical utilities, that were pretty zippy on campus now were some hundreds of miles away with these servers located in like Western Virginia uh, for Amazon's uh, uh, data center there. So to address some of those latter concerns, and because being computer scientists and sort of geeks at heart, we thought it would be fun to sort of replicate on campus what Amazon is doing in the cloud so that we not only have full control over the underlying software stack, we also control the hardware as well. Um, and thanks to a grant from Google, we were able to buy a whole bunch of Dell servers on which we installed VMware ESX and later VMware ESXi, ran all of this ourselves as a class, still maintained root access, being able to examine students' code, lower latency now that we're on campus, but just as, if not more time consuming to administer, now we reintroduce this need for space power and cooling, which at least at the university is much easier said than done these days. Uh, less scalable and so far as we have a finite amount of rack space, we had a finite amount of grant. And so we weren't going to be able to scale as our numbers online might have grown. Certainly less reliable, since we ourselves were in charge of it now. And so ultimately, around 2011, did we transition away from a, client, a local on-campus cluster of virtualized servers to a distributed network of virtual machines running on students' own laptops. Indeed, this was around the time that 
Uh, well, we realized certainly on campus that most everyone in the course, some 98, 99% of students already had laptops, so they had a decent amount of compute power already on their computers. And also, more so than that, we realized that this course happened to be open courseware since 2007, at the start of this story, uh, whereby all of the course's resources, homework assignments, code, PDFs, exams, all freely available online for anyone to engage with. But historically, for many years, the students online, pursuing this for their own edification, filling in gaps in their knowledge, could only engage with the course passively. They could watch videos of us in class. They could try to figure out how to configure their Macs or PCs to work just like that cloud environment at Harvard or in Amazon's cloud service, but we weren't giving shell accounts to hundreds or thousands of students online, so there really was this barrier and they couldn't engage actively. So we started to play around with client-side virtual machines and VirtualBox and VMware tools and the like, and we developed purely for that open courseware audience a client-side appliance, a downloadable virtual machine called the CS50 Appliance that used XFCE and a very lightweight tool chain that gave students now a graphical environment, which pedagogically also let us dabble with even more a higher ceiling in class, giving students the ability to write graphical software and the like, while still giving them a uniform environment irrespective of their Mac, PC, or own Linux computer. These were some of the ingredients that originally went into that, later replaced with these using uh, Xubuntu Now and VMware uh, Fusion and Workstation, which at least around the, uh, the time we deployed was more stable. We found then VirtualBox for students. And so now we had still a more familiar environment for students, graphical tools that they could actually use, distributed the load across multiple laptops, which isn't necessarily compelling for 800 students on campus, but for the several thousand students we therefore had in the open courseware environment, it was absolutely key. Uh, so that we weren't standing up thousands of shell accounts on our own limited infrastructure. We were able now to let students run on their own machines their own instances of Apache and MySQL or Railstack or Python or anything they want, especially for the course's final project for which they can implement most anything of interest, and so they could install anything they want, and anyone ultimately could engage actively with the content. Um, it's easier said than done. We've spent hundreds of hours over those years just configuring the damn thing. And it's not because virtualization is hard per se, or Ubuntu or Fedora are hard per se, but we would invariably run up against every possible stupid little bug in the process of building a virtual machine. And actually running the kickstart process or the like can take tens of minutes. And so too often did we find ourselves really just wasting time trying to figure out what was wrong during that build process, and it just wasn't a pleasant experience. The end result was wonderful for students and amortized over thousands of students on campus and off was still worth it, but it came very expensively to the staff time. Uh, the virtualization overhead was non-trivial. This was around the time that netbooks were very much in vogue, and having a gigahertz of CPU cycle and two gigs of RAM was enough, but not really when you want to run something like this on your laptop as well. And many students, uh, a non-trivial number of students at, at Harvard were starting to have those at the time. And then there were just annoying bugs, especially in VirtualBox some years ago, whereby if a student reasonably closed his or her laptop lid because they were done for the night, uh, the uh, virtual drive didn't necessarily park itself very cleanly. And so they wake up the next morning and they have a bricked hypervisor without any files to be retrievable uh, without significant manual intervention or technical support. And the thing was just slow. It could take a minute or two or more just to boot up or to resume from suspension. Over time, we made some marginal improvements that helped with this, such software as this, which gave us back a team viewer gave us back eyes into students' uh, environments. Guest editions and VMware tools allowed it to resize and generally feel much more like their native machine. And then Dropbox, just having the ability for the appliance to automatically sync to some cloud service meant that it doesn't matter if you brick your appliance once a week, you can just download a new one, resync, and be up and running. So it at least was a nice stopgap um, until containers came along. So as of 2015, just a year ago, we dived full um, we dive headfirst into Dockerization of the course's various environments. And there's a number of different environments in which we've started to deploy to to Docker uh, for, and we've been very excited insofar as it's addressed a lot of the minuses that have still been on the screen here as we discuss. In particular, these are the three high-level environments that we've begun to Dockerize over the past year, the development environment used by the course's own staff. So we have about uh, 100 teaching fellows and course assistants that ultimately make this 800-plus student course possible. Most of that staff are undergraduates themselves for whom a lot of the technology is new, for whom we're trying to introduce them to new technologies and, and build them up as well. And so we have a subset of that staff very often over January semester, mid midterms, uh, as well as over the summer, doing software development with us for the course 
And so that's one of the first environments we've focused on. We now provide, or are starting to provide our staff, instead of with the so-called CS50 appliance, into which we just kept apt getting and installing this and that and this other thing. So if we had a half a dozen web apps that the staff were developing, they would pretty much install all of the dependencies for those half dozen apps inside of the same virtual machine, which was never terribly maintainable. There were other solutions we could uh, uh, address this uh, with, Vagrant and the like, but ultimately we wanted simplicity. And so we started to latch onto a tool chain involving downloading Docker Toolbox, or more recently now, Docker for Mac or Docker for Windows, so that the teaching staff can now be provided by us uh, instructors in the class um, a uniform environment on which they can start to layer the course's own software. So for instance, what we've started to do and we'll start to teach over the coming year is providing students with like a base image called here CS50 slash PHP, which is available publicly in Docker Hub, which is just a nice clean installation of PHP, some latest version and using either Apache or Nginx configured in as standard a way as we can with a minor amount of conventions imposed in the documentations readme, whereby to get a web app working, you simply inherit from this in your Docker file, and you make sure that all of your files go in like slash serve, slash dub, 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 and everything just works. Students can therefore build on top of the Docker file, can start to reconfigure it, add more software, however they see fit, but we have a nice, clean, arguably pedagogically simplif uh, simplified layer on which they begin can begin instead of, say, some of the official Docker images that are require wrapping your mind around a lot more configuration, at least at first glance. We've taken to you using Docker Compose quite a bit. So if unfamiliar, Docker Compose is a wonderful tool whereby you can stand up multi-container applications, meaning you might have an application server running PHP or Python or Ruby or whatnot. You might have a caching server in memcache. You might have a database server in MySQL. And if for local development, you want to provide your staff or in our case, our teaching fellows, with a quick and easy way of running all three of those services in parallel, even though when this application gets deployed to our production environment in the so-called cloud, we don't need that database server or that caching server. We just need the application server uh, in the production environment. We can essentially stub out the memcache and MySQL configurations as follows. So this is a snippet, simplified snippet of a Docker Compose file, whereby if we want to provide our teaching staff in an environment with a memcache server, we simply have this excerpt here inside of the Docker Compose file. This is just the standard memcache daemon, no configuration whatsoever, just using it out of the box because we just need something that works to stub it out on their own machine. MySQL, meanwhile, the default image, nice and enough, allows you to specify an environment variable called MySQL root password. And if we choose something arbitrary like 12345, the first time that container boots, it's going to set the root MySQL password to exactly that which can now be injected into the teaching fellow's development environment so that he or she can now execute queries on that uh, uh, stub of a database. And then here might be the application. So I've arbitrarily called it app. I'm assuming it's going to build whatever the files are in my current working directory. And I'm going to call the resulting container just app. And then we have a whole bunch of environment variables that we set in this Docker Compose file like the caching host should be memcached, which matches the name earlier, uh, the cache port being the default 11211, and then a whole bunch of database-related environment variables that can be relatively insecure because these are just running on a local Mac or PC uh, without external connections to the internet. But what's key here is that via that links key in the YAML file, we're specifying that in the Etsy hosts file of the application server, it should know what the IP address is of the memcache server and the MySQL server, whatever it is that Docker assigned to those virtual services. Port forwarding is just configured to be simply 8080 here. And then we want to mount the current working directory inside of the container at slash serve slash dub 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 so that whatever files are locally here automatically appear to be the root of that web server. And then that's it. Now the students or the staff can simply run uh, Docker up uh, or the Docker Compose up and actually run this file, get this environment such that they have exactly the environment we want them to have. Um, simple little things that we've automated over time, just providing the teaching staff with make files like this with directives for just pulling the latest, building, rebuilding it without caching, uh, calling Docker Compose up to actually bring up that three container environment. And then super usefully, just having a little shell shortcut for uh, getting a shell inside of the container with that ladder line there. So just some pedagogically, if not technologically com uh, compelling little shortcuts with which we provide the staff. But also, have we started to do this? Rather than have just web-based programming environments for the staff, trying to give them a uniform command line environments. We have a lot of uh, shell scripts and tools that are just frankly annoying to actually figure out how to get running uh, on your own Mac, on your own PC, or even your own Linux box without having to document innumerable numbers of dependencies that everyone has to install, presumably have the same version number. So what we really wanted with Docker was to be able to have a very easy way of just giving all 
all of the teaching staff uh, a simple way to have a uniform command line environment that we call CS50 CLI available there that just has a bunch of command line tools pre-installed. And so long as a teaching uh, member of the teaching staff runs a magical incantation like this, which ultimately can go in an alias file or shell script or batch file, do they just get a blinking prompt? This is CS50 CLI, whereby on their Mac or PC, they have access to all of the course's command line tool chains as well. Beyond that, though, there's a couple of other environments that we focused uh, a lot of our attention on. The course's production environment. So for this particular class, we have a whole bunch of web applications, six or 12 or so at any given time, written either by the staff or even by some of the course's students, that we want to live publicly on the internet. And historically, we used just Amazon EC2, and we would install on EC2 a whole bunch of homegrown ops code scripts, things for deployment, Git hook, uh, post commit hooks, and the like. But it was just very annoying to maintain a lot of this spaghetti code, if you will, all on our own. So we started looking around a year or so ago at what we could use to automate as much of this as possible so that using existing authentication mechanisms like GitHub and its whole permissions model and teams, we could give certain staff access to certain code repositories and maybe certain access to certain branches therein so that ultimately only when code is pushed to some repo's master branch is it sort of magically deployed with our actually having to intervene beyond uh, approving a pull request on a repo. And so currently, we're using this trio of tools, GitHub to store the code, CodeChip, which is a third-party service in the middle via which we can create a post commit hook so that when a teaching fellow submits a pull request, making having made changes to some piece of code that one of us reviews, we click accept pull request. The master branch then gets merged in. CodeShip via hook is informed, hey, this web app has been updated. In turn, inside of CodeShip, is there a configuration that then pushes that same code to what we're currently using, Elastic Beanstalk, which, if unfamiliar, is one of Amazon's uh, high-level web services that allows you to use Docker underneath the hood, but have what they call an environment running your container or containers. And so in this way, are we able to per wonderfully automate the process of just doing a simple git push, and in the end, it actually gets set up for us on that environment. What do we have to do to make all this work? Well, if you recall from the Docker Compose file, which is really just meant to be used for local development, we simply define inside of CodeShip some of those same environment variables, so that instead of pointing to the local throwaway memcache server or MySQL server, now these environment variables and ports are pointing to long-living uh, caching servers and MySQL servers that are running 24-7 inside of Amazon's cloud. Much longer host names, maybe a different port, but those are meant to be persistently stored so that at the end of the day, the teaching staff know that these variables exist. They don't know what they are in the cloud. They don't know what the credentials are, and so relatively few of us, therefore, can ultimately be the arbiters between the code and the production environment itself. So the third and sort of final umbrella of environments in which we've started dockerizing students' experience is in the following way. So over the past year, we've been transitioning away from that so-called client-side virtual machine to, as I said, containers, specifically using a web-based IDE uh, called Cloud9, a startup based out of Amsterdam and San Francisco with whom we've been working closely on making available um, a, uh, a workspace, if you will, a pedagogically simplified integrated development environment that nonetheless has itself a very high ceiling. Even though we have stripped away via Cloud9's own APIs and a wonderful plugin model, we have eliminated a lot of the visual distractions and a lot of the unnecessary menu options in bulk of something like Eclipse or NetBeans or the like, giving students the appearance of a very simplified in infrastructure, they nonetheless retain a built-in terminal window, a web-based terminal window that at the end of the day still gives them pseudo access and full ability to install anything they want inside of not a virtual machine now, but a container. So they can go as deeply into the software stack as they'd like, but it also has a nice user-friendly GUI via which they can do uh, web programming and command line programming uh, in C and other languages. So in fact, if you go, for instance, and we'd like to play after today, if you go to c9.io and then log in and go to slash new, you'll see that CS50 is actually among the templates, so to speak, that Cloud9 provides at bottom right there, whereby you can immediately stand up a software stack for, designed for HTML or Node.js or PHP or CS50 itself via that icon. And it gives you ultimately a little environment that looks a little something like this here. Um, but there is a non-trivial demographic out there, especially with our open courseware push and with our MOOC push, whereby students don't necessarily have constant internet access, certainly not internet access as many of us enjoy at work or at home these days, or it's very expensive, or it's simply non-existent. And so one of the use cases we realized was going to be important was actually having an offline version 
of an environment that was by design and deliberately meant to be an online solution. And so for this, too, we lean on Docker as well. And thanks to our friends at Cloud9 and a colleague of mine, Dan Armendariz, have we also been able to provide some of our students for whom internet access is not a given, an offline version of the same. Dan. Now, this is where the containers actually come into play a little bit more obviously. So in the, in the prior side, we actually saw the development environment itself. Uh, in this case, the container, the, so Cloud9 actually uses Docker underneath the hood, but the, the container is almost a little bit of an abuse of what Docker is meant for. In this case, it's almost used in, as a lightweight virtual machine such that the container is actually running uh, essentially Tmux and some other shell scripts so that actually the, the student sees an entire workspace or enti an entire computer essentially, an entire Ubuntu instance contained within a single Docker container. And this actually made it very convenient for us to be able to produce an offline version of this because we could take precisely that same container and add some additional stuff onto it so that we could actually provide students to be able to download. Now, there's a couple of things that had to happen in order to allow this to function. First of all, Cloud9 has an infrastructure that is probably familiar to many people. You have a CDN that's able to uh, down, download all of the client-side scripts and such that actually provide the JavaScript that load the UI itself. But then underneath the hood, there is, of course, this Docker instance that's run somewhere in the cloud that these client-side scripts must communicate with in order to actually provide the functionality to the student. So in other words, the terminal window itself, uh, which also supplies a lot of other things like the, uh, the debugger, um, the clang and compilers, and the ability to run the student's code directly within this instance. Now, when we're using the offline version of this instead, we want to provide students with a single Docker container that can do all of these same things. Now, although Cloud9 has a hosted version of its service, which is actually really useful and it provides a lot of cloud-based functionality that you might expect from things that are hosted online, like a very useful feature uh, where multiple people can collaborate on the same instance, which is something that we didn't actually have in the past, uh, we, uh, we have to get rid of some of those things in order to produce the offline version. But we can do this by basically merging the two and having a little bit of a slide fail here. Uh, such that both the Docker instance provides the client-side scripts and also the underlying functionality of that instance itself. Who knows what's going on here. So basically, with the Docker file, if we can paraphrase what's happening, we have this Docker file that rests on top of this, uh, this existing build for the online version. And essentially, we rely on uh, providing some plugins. And plugins, in this case, are in the context of Cloud9, which provides a very robust API to modify the appearance and the behavior of the, of the service as a whole. We're able to populate a couple of, of environment variables that effectively notify this instance that it is being run in an offline environment and to reconfigure itself in a couple of contexts, because we use Apache and some other web-based services, to uh, work equivalently on an offline machine as an online one. And, when, and then finally, we download and install the Cloud9 SDK, which is open source and actually provides a lot of this functionality directly. So now this effectively, without having to create anything else, allows us to uh, build an offline version of the Cloud9 IDE with our modifications built on top of it. And we can provide this to students, in which, uh, and you can find it as well on Docker Hub and download it. And this provided quite a few benefits over the appliance uh, version that we had a little while ago, which is that even though we've now even though we're slightly abusing the Docker model, where, where it's, it's a little bit of a, like a monolithic application, it does provide a pedagogical benefit to students that are trying to understand what is happening with their environments. It's a little bit easier to explain effectively a lightweight virtual machine than to explain all of the nuances that Docker can actually provide, especially to first-time computer science learners. And so these are some of the benefits that this actually provides to us. But it also allows us to segment students' code very easily. So they can, whether using the online or the offline version, run their own code in their own environment that we have created and curated for them. But this did bring up the need for some additional tools as well that allow us to segment their code in other contexts. Indeed. So for the past several years, as part of students' environment, 
environment, we have a, hope, <laughs> a theoretically secure environment for execution of uh, potentially malicious code. Um, for the most part, we can trust uh, the 800 students we have on campus to not necessarily submit some code that we then blindly compile and execute that then deletes all of our personal files. But with thousands of people online, we were truly worried over the past several years of sort of embarrassing ourselves very publicly. And so we decided to take an incredibly defensive approach rather than just rest on sort of policy alone to police what kind of code we are actually executing that students are then submitting. So we introduced some years ago what we call CS50 Sandbox, which essentially is a secure sandboxed environment that runs as a bottommost layer here, on top of which we built a software-based HTTP API, just a little Node.js service that takes in input and code from the web and then runs it inside of a sandbox and spits out the standard output or standard error results in a nutshell. And on top of that, we built a pair of tools, CS50 Run, which was a web-based programming environment that we've since replaced with Cloud9's much more featureful version, and then CS50 Check, which we continue to use, which is a command line tool by which students can submit their code to our servers. We run a whole bunch of functional correctness tests on it, and out gets spit some score and some standard output and standard error. And in the first version of this, and what we're currently still using, we used Fedora Linux back in the day. We used SE Linux to actually sandbox students' code as much as we could using Node.js, strace, uh, PAM limits, nice IP tables, and a few other ingredients to really try to lock down the environment in which students' code was running as much as possible. This has been incredibly heavyweight. It's been very fragile. SE Linux is among the, my least favorite pieces of software, just in terms of its configuration alone. Alone. And for several years have we been searching for something to replace this in version 2. And indeed, the ingredients to our next version, Ubuntu being uh, sort of incidental, um, is to actually replace this environment with Docker. So that the vision over the coming months now is to phase out that old infrastructure, replace it with a Dockerized version so that when students submit some arbitrary code, particularly in C, which we then compile and execute blindly, will spawn in this vision a lightweight Docker container that has all of the same tools that the student's own programming environment in the cloud has, so as to run their code, assess it, and actually then kill off the container in any maliciousness, intentional or otherwise, that might have been conducted inside of this. Beyond that, too, we're taking a closer look at Docker Cloud, formerly Tutum, to actually look at deployment uh, opportunities for us. The reason we are using Amazon Elastic Beanstalk um, is is largely because of the simplicity, relatively speaking, with which we can deploy from GitHub to CodeShip to Elastic Beanstalk. Unfortunately, Beanstalk, while it does support multi-container applications, uh, which we tend not to use ourselves, um, it uses one uh, virtual machine per Docker application, which just gets unnecessarily expensive when we have a half a dozen or a dozen or so a wet, lightweight web applications that certainly don't need even the smallest of Amazon's uh, uh, instance types. And so using Docker Cloud, we hope, will actually um, distribute the load of these applications across multiple instances using Docker's own model as well. Transitioning away with our staff from Docker Toolbox uh, to Docker for Mac and Windows more natively, using Kitematic ultimately, we hope, to really provide, perhaps with, alongside of other tools, a single D image or EXE that students can download for the offline version, double click it, and voila, they're up and running. Right now, the process of doing, as Dan described, the offline IDE's configuration does involve a non trivial number of steps which isn't ideal for introductory students when that's their first impression. Um, and then transitioning to something like Ubuntu 16 as well, which underneath the hood has a number of software changes that aren't currently compatible with our current environment. Um, and so that is on the agenda as well. And so I would say if I had to distill some of our recommendations, certainly for higher ed or really just folks who are exploring um, Dockerization of some environment right now. Um, in academia, it's absolutely been compelling for us for large courses, far more so than virtual machines themselves because of the weight involved and because of the uh, speed with which to even spawn those things locally for some students. Um, it has been an enabling technology absolutely for us for open courseware and the ability to connect with any number of students, all of whom are engaging at their own pace but have relatively uh, finite resources that aren't necessarily coming to campus and so forth, but nonetheless want to engage more actively. Being able to spawn things so lightweight has been uh, enabling us to connect with those students as well. Web programming, just the mere idea that we can provide students with starting points for PHP applications. Node.js, Rails, Python, or the like, in a way that they can run multiple such services in their same environment, as opposed to the appliance, which required a little more customization, has been compelling. And then the one most glaring negative I would propose is that the most, it's a two-edged sword. By far, one of the most uh, frustrating yet exciting aspects of this whole experience has been just how bleeding-edged it all is. And indeed, even this morning, I started reading up on the latest documentation and Googling around to make sure I don't embarrass myself by not being familiar with some latest and greatest solutions 
solution. Um, and it's been fun and challenging to keep up with. But it's certainly been a wonderful set of solutions to a number of problems we've had here at Harvard. Um, all of these slides, if you'd like, are available at this URL here. And both Dan and I would be happy to take any questions. That's not where the slides are. <laughs> right there. Any questions? Yeah. One second. Microphones. Hi, so you mentioned wow. that uh, all the negatives with the other solutions you tried. Um, are there any negatives besides being bleeding edge with your current setup? Um, it's a good question. Certainly the offline aspect has required a non-trivial amount of effort on Dan's and others' parts. Um, that's in part a function of just the, the, the youth of some of the software and even our own unfamiliarity with it. Um, downside has certainly been the time involved and just the youth of so many of these services. Code ship among them, shippable in any number of them that we tried some time ago. It's certainly for me personally been just very overwhelming, being hit with this fire hose of technologies and these startups that are all hopping on the bandwagon of solving this problem and that. It's been hard for me to sort of wrap my mind around what the right solutions are. And so that's one of the, the hopes we have in just sharing some of our lessons learned is to avoid that. Um, technologically. Well, I, I think overall being on the bleeding edge means that the experiences aren't quite as streamlined for the students as well. And this is very important to us to make sure that we are able to do that. And so as David alluded to before, we have to, students that want to use the offline IDE have to basically copy paste in a rather lengthy Docker run command, which is not precisely the experience that we want to have. But of course, tools will eventually become more mature and, and actually flesh all of this out. But I think just all subtleties related to, in fact, this bleeding edge does uh, hurt us more than anything. Other questions? You mentioned you guys are using since last year, and are the students deploying the Docker containers on their laptops? And since Docker for laptop Mac and Windows is recently available in beta version still, so so I'm, I'm guessing they still have to deal with VirtualBox or something on their laptop even to run those offline versions, right? And the no, the only time students install Docker software on their own laptops is if, one, they're members of the teaching staff and actually doing software development for tools that students will then use predominantly in the cloud via Cloud9 and via CS50's own uh, theme thereof. Um, or if they have so infrequent or so inexpensive or so slow internet access that they do need to put the Cloud9 environment locally on their computer, at which point, yes, they would install Docker. Up until uh, weeks or months ago, they would only install Docker Toolbox. And that's what we still encourage them to do until uh, Mac and Windows emerges from beta. Um, but the Docker for Mac and for Windows will be a more native solution that will take VirtualBox out of the picture, but create, in theory, the same user, uh, the end user experience, or the illusion thereof. Hey, great talk. Um, so I, uh, I work with uh, Launch Code, and we love CS50, teaching it to new people, help them get placed with jobs. Um, and getting rid of the appliance is fantastic for new users, I have to say. Uh, do you foresee uh, containerization becoming almost a staple of, of learning in CS50 and in your class in the EDX sort of classes? It's a good question. I don't know if I'd call it a staple, in, in part because when we introduced the cloud, when the word was entering the vernacular years ago, none of our students particularly cared. I mean, we could motivate it, certainly, and we could explain it technologically and the academics of it. But at the same time, so much else was new to them, programming and algorithms and data structures and the like, that I think it's a juicier topic, I think, from, uh, for higher level classes. And I don't really foresee us, us as a class curricularly, spending a huge amount of time teaching that particular technology, but rather using it, especially at the tail end of the class, as part of an exit ramp via which, when students have this now foundation in computer science and software programming, if they want to go off and learn some Rails programming or Python using Docker as the officially recommended platform which, which to do that, instead of MAMP or ZAMP or any number of other individual pieces of software that historically they might have installed instead. Wonderful work. Um, what are you doing for grading and automated testing, and how do you balance that with academic integrity? A good question. So we use what we call CS50 Sandbox, actually run students' code. We have our own uh, lightweight language, a DSL, via which we can specify functional tests, black box 
text, testing for students' code, whereby we pass in certain inputs when we hope to get certain outputs back, either in terms of exit codes or in standard out or standard error messages. Um, we then assign that to score 0 or 1, which get put in ultimately to our database. For academic honesty, we do now have a corpus of thousands, if not tens of thousands, of submissions over the past 10 years of fairly similar programming assignments. And we do each year for the on-campus students, the 800 at Harvard, 350 at uh, Extension, and 300 at Yale, actually pairwise compare n squared all of those students' code against each other's as well as the preceding nine or so years of code, um, and then humanize, ultimately adjudicate what similarities are statistically unlikely. But to get us to that last point, we use tools from Stanford called MOS, Measure of Software Similarity, as well as eTector from Princeton, which essentially do that pairwise n squared comparison and then show you with two iframes in a window, uh, submission A and solution, uh, submission B, if they are uh, worrisomely similar, at which point human eyes take over. And for other levels, uh, like CS50AP, which is taught at the high school level, uh, we frequently see that some teachers like to be added as collaborators to online workspaces, which means that they can actually see the entirety of the source code or the entirety of the project that the student is actually working on and perhaps do more hands-on evaluation in that way as well. And one more question. Thank you. Um, so I guess one question I had is, have you noticed any particularly strong reactions from the student side? Or how are they feeling about it? And have you noticed any, I guess, changes um, using containers in Docker that you hadn't seen before? Short answer, no. But I would echo, uh, I think, reactions I've had thus far, which is, um, as our friend from Launch Code alluded to, the appliance was very heavyweight. And especially for students with older hardware or, hard or whenever you run a Windows update, things tended to break. And so I think it's inevitable that this kind of environment belongs in the cloud, sort of short-term challenges of internet access aside. And so if anything, we have reduced the number of headaches that our introductory students experience, even though they themselves might not realize as much because they didn't take the course, of course up a year prior. All right, thank you so much, and a round of applause for our speakers.